you mention names and those people who usually are related in that regard, they are people who were known as people who bore the secrets of the Prophet ﷺ. In ala ru'usihim, possibly the greatest of them, whom? Sayyidina Hudhayfir ibn Yaman, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa And so Sayyidina Hudhayfir ibn Yaman, he's known as sahibu sir. He's known as the bearer of the prophetic secret, the sir the nabawi. I say to Hudayfa radiallahu anhu warda, he knew things that other people did not have access to. Say to Hudayfa radiallahu anhu warda, he knew the reality of that which is inside of the human soul. That's why the likes of Ibn, Ibn al Khattab, say to Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda, would go on to say to Hudayfa al Yaman and ask for knowledge about his soul, his own reality. Umar, the one who's characterized with knowledge in the hadith al Bukhari, al ilm, al ilm, the Prophet said about Sayyidina Umar ibn al Khattab. Yet al ilm al ilm ibn al Khattab goes on to the bearer of the secrets of the Prophet Sayyidina Hudayfa ibn Yaman. Both Hudayfa as well as Sayyidina Umar ibn al Khattab in the Sahih that they make mention of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallam. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallam Umar says. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallam Hudayfa says taught us everything that occurred from the beginning of time until the people of paradise enter paradise and the people of hell enter. That's the words of Umar. In the Sahih, that's the words of Sayyidina Hudayfid al-Yaman. Radiallahu anhu warda. Those who remember, remember, and those who forgot, forgot, he said, Hudayfa. And he said, and I too forget sometimes. He said, the same way that somebody forgets a person maybe who they grew up with, who they know very well, but that person ghab anhu. That person disappears for a while. And you forget about him. Only that when he returns upon your fair sight of him, you remember him, who he is. He said the same with the events that unfold inside of my lifetime. There are many an event that I forgot that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, told me about that event. Say that when the event falls, when the event enacts, then I remember I took it min fair. Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the mouth of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallam. That's Kalam of Sayyidina Hudayfin al Yaman. Hudayfa reminds us, yani, look at the knowledge of Hudayfa. He says there is not a single person that will manifest upon the face of the earth who causes tribulations or wars, say that I know his name, I know his father's name, and I know the tribe that he's from. Every single one, Sayyidina Hudayfa, when you're a man, says. From amongst them, the great Bitana, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the great companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Likewise, one of those who is synonymous with knowledge, of the most knowledgeable of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu A person who can speak in his life with the Qur'an and not use human words, Kalam Bashar, just use the words of Allah Ta'ala, Kalam Allah, Sayyidina Abdullah bin Mas'ud. He said there's not a single verse in the Qur'an say, I say that I know the verse, I know where it was revealed, I know when it was revealed, I know the meaning behind that verse. Only two people ever made that claim. One was Ba'ab Madina to the the gateway to knowledge, Ali ibn Abi Talib, the second Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu wa ta'ala. The Prophet Sallallahu told Ibn Umar, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, now I remove the veil between me and you. And you become from those who are the bitana. You enter into the inner sphere of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will now bequeath unto Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, knowledge of that which is a bequeath to the Sahaba, regardless of their greatness and their superiority over Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. The likes of also Sayyidina Abu Huraira, Sayyidina Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda. And despite the brevity of the time that he spends with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam, ma'adil al-ilm al-ilahi, dhahidan wa batina, that he is the awe, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of all knowledge, divine knowledge, manifest and hidden, sallallahu alayhi wa sahi wa sallam, but despite the paucity of the time, the frugality of the time, that Sayyidina Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu warda, who comes from that blessed land of the Yemen, unto what Medina to Manawara, and sits with the Prophet Sallallahu for only two years, regardless that he becomes prolific in the relating knowledge from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that was manifest and, and hidden likewise. You look at the tradition inside of the Sahih of Sayyidina Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu warda, uti tu he says, I was given two vessels, vessels of knowledge from the Prophet Sallallahu The first vessel, he says, I've conveyed it to you. That vessel, ilm of vahir, knowledge of the manifest, knowledge of the outward. Sayyidina Abu Huraira is the most prolific narrator on behalf of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No more, nobody more prolific than Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu warda. 
save the other vessel. Sayyidina Abu Hurairah says, were I to relate it to you, you would sever my throat. Sever it, my throat. It's an amanah. It's a trust. And he's of the trustworthy, radiallahu ta'ala, and the word of. And that which he has are of two types. Just like Sayyidina Hudayfa. And of them, it relates to the things that we all need. Things like theology. And the things like spirituality. And the things like jurisprudence. Uh, those things that he took from the Prophet sallallahu But they're the things that relate to a higher order. An unseen order. A subtle order. Whether they relate to the depths of the human soul. That we're here to manifest them, like Sayyidina Zayn al Abidin, Ali bin Hussein, Sib, Yan ibn al Sibt, Radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda says, Were I to manifest them, you would consider us ibad al wafana, you would consider us to be idolaters. Were I to manifest that? That's the Imam of Medina, Sayyidina Zayn al Abidin, who says, Ahlul Wirath are those who inherited from the Prophet. Sayyidina Abu Huraira likewise, Were I to manifest it, and he did this in one rewind, you would slit my throat, Abu Huraira, Radiallahu anhu warda says. Knowledge that relates to the depths of the reality of the human being is Khilafat Allah, the Anifil Khan, as the vicegerent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside of the universe. But likewise, knowledge that relates to umur, affairs that manifest after the ascent of the Prophet to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at a tradition, third century tradition, and the manuscripts you go and find inside of Istanbul of Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu wa ta'ala. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa he said that the Prophet sallallahu mentioned to me something about sitin of his knowledges that would occur, which would occur inside of the what? The seventh century, sitin, which he didn't know which one, he had a seventh decade. He had a, is it once, is it 60, 160, 260, 360, 460, 560, 660, 760, 860, 960, 1060, 1160, 1260, 1360, are we on the eve of it in 1460? Which 60? The Prophet said 60. I said, Abu Huraira, Allah anhu warda. He said, that which the Prophet told me, that I placed that inside of my prayer. That it was so dire that Sayyidina Abu Huraira personalized it to the 60 that was approaching him, the year 60. And so in the prayer of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu warda, he used to say inside of his dua, Allahumma la tubalighuni sitin. Oh Allah, don't allow me to live to 60. At the age of 60, 60 after the hijrah, the flight of the Prophet And Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu warda, he dies in the year 59. Radiallahu anhu, before the dua maqbool, accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise, the topic that we have at hand of our teachers who spoke about the age of the Mahdi al muntadir of the awaited and the prophesied Mahdi on behalf of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahi wa sallam, of our teachers. And he mentioned that he left the, the, the deserts of the Sahara in order to be inside of the blessed city of Taiba, the city of the Prophet ﷺ. And he remained therein as quote-unquote an illegal citizen. But Ahlullah, the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ta are not illegal upon the earth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're not illegal in the cosmos of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Ard, Ardullah, land, is the land of God. Wahu Arduhum, and it's their land likewise. But it remains there inside the Medina to Munawwara. And he says, if news comes unto me that the Mahdi has manifested, my dua is Allah, Allahumma qbid ruhi ala. Oh Allah Ta'ala, take my soul now. Because for us, many of us, it's an adventure. Yeah? It's exciting. But we haven't personalized the reality of the age that approaches. We haven't personalized, truly understood the reality of what it means, the Mahdi al-Muntadir, and that which will manifest inside of his age. So you get a sense of the, the knowledge of Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu warda. Because of the things that the Ahlullah, the people of Amana fear most, is that that which the Prophet sallallahu bequeaths to them, that they become people who hide it or prevent that knowledge from people. Okay? The Ahlul Kitman. Okay? Those who conceal knowledge from those who are true heirs of that knowledge. So it's a fear that they have. And look at the last moments of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda when he informs those who are around him that there's knowledge that the Prophet Sallallahu has given me about specific events that I fear relating it to you. I, whether you, you are people of trust such that you deserve it or you are people who lack trust such that I relate it to you and thereby Allah Ta'ala and his messenger take me into account for that. They said, Ya Abu Huraira, akhbirna jazakullahu khairan. Tell us what the Prophet told you and have no fear whatsoever. And so Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu warda, 
said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama informed me that in the year 1300, wa aqada uquda, then he began to count out decades in the year 1300, that Malik al-Rum, that the leader of Europe, that he desires to wage war upon the entire earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires for war to manifest. فَعَقَدَ عُقُودَ And then he began to عَقَدَ الْعُقُودَ twice. And he gives you two decades. Two decades thereafter, a person from a place called German well, what would declare war inside of Europe in order to conquer the entire world. وَإِسْمُهُ سَيِّدُ kabir He's called the Sayyid al-Kabir, the supreme leader. وَإِسْمُهُ الْحِرْ His name in the riwayah Hir, not the riwayah Ismu Hitler, saying Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa said. And then he goes to war. And then he's going to be vanquished. He says, and he'll be killed by Sirru Rush or Sirru Rus. He'll be killed by an assassin from Rush or Rus, Russia. That's what Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa said. And then he says, thereafter, in the year 1300, Waqad al Aquda, five or six, that is 1350 or 1360, they will come forth from the land of Misr, from the land of Egypt, a person he made mention of. You call Lahu Nasir, that his name is Nasir. Yud'a'in al Arab, he's called with the Arabs, a Shuja, the brave one. Lakin Allah yadhallahu, Allah Ta'ala will abase him. Thereafter, will manifest in the most blessed of all months, fi shuhur al Mubaraka, yani Ramadan, manifest inside of Ramadan. A person whose name is Sada, Ibn al Anwar, he said, Anwar Sadat. Where to say Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu upon his deathbed, who will manifest, and Allah subhanahu wa taala will grant him a victory, save that he will go into contract with Lusus Beit al Maqdis, with the thieves of the holy sanctuary of Jerusalem. He'll go into contract. Then he carries on radiallahu taala anhu warda that in what in the year 1400 will manifest the Mahdi al Muntadi. The way to say Abu Huraira radiallahu taala anhu warda. وَعَقَدَ الْعُقُودَ And he alluded to two or three. The ulama don't know what that means, two or three. When does that mean? And in what year, what date in the 1400 of the Muslims that we currently live in? And then he said he manifests. And then he declares war upon the land of the Arabs. And he's going to declare war upon the land of the Romans himself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant him victory. So that he'll be the one who reclaims Bayt al maqdis Look at the clan of Sum, the Sayyid, radiallahu ta'ala, anhu wa ra Sayyid Abu Huraira. What do you understand about those type of words that Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu who speaks about? And that is just the tip of the iceberg. Because what the Prophet Sallallahu bequeathed is perfect knowledge as it, as it concerns the ages that approach or the ages that have gone. What's important about that type of tradition that you can go and find in the libraries of Istanbul that date back to the 3rd century, the, 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 the manuscripts themselves, is that it bequeaths to us knowledge of things that we're already aware of. Hatman, the things of history as it relates to us. But at the same time, it bequeaths to us knowledge of things that are yet to come. So, so the people who are da'if al iman, that who are weak in terms of faith, that they can use the certainty of what they know of to become certain of that which they do not know of, of that which is to come. This is the ages that the Prophet ﷺ has spoken about. In our last gathering, we spoke about the great tradition of the Prophet ﷺ, which is the hadith of Sayyidina Thawban inside of Abu Dawood, and it's a hadith that governs up until the manifestation of the Mahdi himself. When the Prophet ﷺ says, that the, the Umam, the nations of the world, will gather, gather together against you gather. And they gather on multiple occasions. And that hadith of Sayyidina Abu Hurairah we made mention of, he mentioned the gathering of every nation upon the face of the earth, illa, except two types. The, those from Bilad al-Thalj and Bilad al-Harb. The two extremities, the northern Scandinavian countries and the Harb, African countries, sub-Saharan, Saharan Africa, who will not gather on a place called Kot as sahir Kuwait, in order to declare war against a person who, the, who we call a Sufiani, who's one of the greatest signs of the Mahdi, a Sufiani. And then he says, a Sufiani who was Saddam. Sufiani is the Saddam. And he's Saddam to ever, whoever opposes him. 
But look at how the nations of the world gather in a specific place, which we'll come to, inshallah ta'ala, what does that tradition mean, a multiple tradition that are related about the individual who's now returned back to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what he made mention of, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, in the tradition of Thawban, on the authority of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al that the nations of the world will gather and descend upon you. Kama al ala In the same way you see hungry diners will ravish a dish of food. Sahaba Allah asked, Amin ya Rasulullah. Is this because we are few in numbers or that day, O Messenger of Allah? The Prophet says, La, no. Bel antum kathir. But you are great in number. Great in number. Walakin kahufa sail. But you are just like the froth upon the ocean. He said. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, la yakhrijanna min kulubikum. Min kulubi a'adaikum. He will take out the hearts of your enemies. Ru'ab, fear of you. Allahu fi qulubikum al -wahm. And Allah Ta'ala will cast into your heart wahm. Wahm. Wa ma wahm ya Rasulullah. What is wahm, O Messenger of Allah? It's the disease of our age. Hubb al dunya wa karahiyat al mawt. A love of the world and an aversion to death. That's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. And so that's what Ahlullah, the people of Allah Ta'ala, called Marhalatul Ghufa'iyah. It's an epoch in human history. Marhalatul Ghufa'iyah, generic. And then there are sub eras inside of that great epoch. That sub era, the Prophet begins with what he calls Fitnatul Ahlas. It's the first of them. In the Marhalatul Ghufa'iyah, in the age of the froth upon the ocean, I where Muslims lack substance. Okay? Yani Islam as a reality in the hearts of human beings becomes virtually meaningless. Look at the great Bitana, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Nasiru. What did he say? <laughs> we live in an age of realities without names. And there'll come upon a man a time of names without realities. Abdullah ibn Nasiru said. That's knowledge from the Rasul. And that's the age in which we live in, where we've got all the names. We've got all of the appellages, but where is the reality those names and appellages represent or indicate? And so, Marhat al Ghufa'iyya is when it's all what superficial. Doesn't, no substance exists inside the Ummah of the Prophet And the first era of that is what the Prophet called Ahlas, Fitnat al Ahlas. And the Ahlas for us in history is what you're going to call the era of the Renaissance, and that what you're going to look at is the colonization of Diyar al Islam, of the Muslim world. That's Fitnat al Ahlas, to put it in brief, not our discussion. Then the Prophet said the next Fitnat that manifests. He called the fitna to sarra'i wa darra'i. He called the fitna of the sarra and the fitna of the darra. And sarra and darra can be happiness and sadness, huh? Right. Joy and pain. But what he means by fitna to sarra, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam, is what begins with the industrial revolution and then it's going to culminate in our age with issues of the technological revolution. Sarra. Where life becomes easy for a human being. That's sarra. The nature of the human being, ajula. It's created in haste. It's hasty. That's his nature. And this world is called the ajila, the abode of haste. And the unadulterated, unadulterated age of haste is the age of the Antichrist. Who's in what? A covenant with the devil. Well, ajula min al shaytan. Haste is from the devil, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said. So the sarra is when we live in the world of instant reality. Where everything, everything, even the very essence of life, like drinking water, has become an easy phenomenon. We just sort of move a tap, a best, or even we just put our hands beneath the tap, and it just flows out. That's the ease of the age. There's no more difficulty in attaining that which we need to drink, or that which we need to eat or modes of transport, or modes of communication. No more difficulty in that regard. That's the fitna to sarra. It's easy. We should be happy. But with happiness comes pain, darra. All of that is harmful for the soul of the human being. Harm. That's fitna to sarra wa darra. Okay? That then will culminate in an age that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called duhayma. That will end, and you'll see the age of the duhayma manifest. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is the age of the Duhayma? 
The age of the Duhayma is when the crisis of the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ reaches critical mass. In what way is that the Qarar, very governance and leadership of the will of the cosmos is taken out of the hands of the Umana, of those trustworthy custodians of the heavenly secret, the heirs of the Prophet themselves, the ulama and the awliya, is taken out of their hands, and the Umara, Atirullah, obey Allah, wa atirul Rasul, and obey the Rasul, wa kulil amri minkum, and those who have the affair over you. Who are the people of the affair? The ulama, the umara, the awliya, they're the Ahlul Qara, they're the people of true heavenly governance, of Siyasat al Samawiyyah, as Al Ghazali, Rahimullah Ta'ala calls it, the heavenly politics. These are the heavenly politicians, those whose politics is on behalf of God, but it's wrenched out of their hands and it's placed in the hands of the enemies of God. That's fitna to do Hayma. And when it's in the hands of the enemy of God, the world is in a state of chaos. It's in a state of Joel, tyranny. It's in a state of full oppression and transgression. That's the age. What is oppression and trans transgression and tyranny? It's defined by our ulama, what rishay fi ghayri mahalli. Is when something is placed in other than its correct place. That's vulm, that's oppression, that's transgression. Al adak, what is more precise? A tasarruf fi haq al ghayr. Where you get involved in the rights of somebody else, things that are none of your business, and the affair a sha'an lillah, wal amr lillah, wa kullu yom huwa fi sha'an, Allah ta'ala. The affair is God lillah al amr, min qabul wa min ba'd. That's the verse in the chapter of the Europeans in the Quran. The affair is God's in the beginning and in the end. And somebody has got involved in God's business who has no right to do whatsoever. At that point, there it's interference on behalf of the divine. And that interference will manifest in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bringing forth an individual who has been long prophesied by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he's been tadar. He's awaited, eagerly awaited. By everybody who has a sound or a pure heart. Sahaba awaited him. Tabi'een awaited him. Atba Tabi'een awaited him. Those great glorious generations. In Al Bukhari, when the Prophet وسلم, he said, Khairu nas qarni, thumma ladheena yalunahum, thumma ladheena yalunahum. The best generation is my generation, then those who follow them, and then those who follow them. Three glorious generations. Say, so in another tradition, the Prophet وسلم, said, there's a fourth. Four glorious generations. Three of those generations, tetra. Warabi' furada. He said, three of them, they will fall in succession. His generation, the companions, those who saw the Prophet The second generation, those who saw, the ones who saw, the Messenger of Allah And then the third generation, those who saw, those that saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa in the third generation. They fall together. And then there's a fourth. And the fourth generation is the first of the major signs of the hour, which is the coming forth of the great Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Mahdi al-Muntadir al-Hasani radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa Prophesied by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sallam. And Iman huwa, who is he? The Mahdi. And how is it that we become people who are able to discern the manifestation of the map? Because the subtlety of the knowledge yani, of the end of time. And so this is really important for us, quote unquote, the students of the age. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always gives dress rehearsals for reality. To see which one of us are people of Siddiq, who are true with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People of Basira, who take our knowledge from the source. And the sources of true knowledge, and which one of us are the kadibin, are people who are liars, who are imitating the reality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent from beyond seven heavens. And so that's the difficulty of the issue of things that relate to the end of time. There are always dress rehearsals. Danny, there has been many a Mahdi, or many a person who's claimed to be a Mahdi in the history of Ahl al-Islam. But unless you understand the signs, 
And unless you have ittila, you're somebody who is being given the amana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to interpretate those signs, then khalas, you become confused by them. Confused. And we start with one of our teachers at a time, and we speak in symbolism, but I'm sure you'll get the point. And so we asked one of our teachers, mashallah, tabarakallah, about realities that were taking place. Now here's how the people of Amana speak. And I mean, one of our teachers of the highest order. And the, 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 the good opinion, the, the bad opinion of the faqir is from the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never mind whatever good opinion that I have. A waste is from the people of Allah ta'ala. At best, only Allah ta'ala ya'arif men who are. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows who he is. So we're asking about what realities, realities, huh? that face us inside of our age. And he says, and it's a private gathering, private, or often, you know, those type of gatherings where they will say, and they will say this literally, see this type of gathering, anybody who bequeaths what I say inside of this gathering, then we fear they will have a bad ending with Allah Ta'ala. You have no permission to reveal what I've, I've just mentioned to you. And if you do, then you'll have a bad ending. Allah Ta'ala will rip faith out of your heart. It's those type of gatherings. They're real gatherings. And so the things he said, Toyin, that we speak in two ways, and the choice is yours. Speak in two ways. The first way, we speak haqqaq. We speak reality. Realities. If we speak realities, then note, you don't mention name, you don't mention place, you don't mention time. Or often, not to be bequeathed in that regard. Otherwise, we give you the official version. Still good. Or often, and we give the official version that you can speak about it. Alhamdulillah. But it gives you a sense there's something beyond, and there are people who are beyond the realities that we see. And really what's important, because we can speak about the Mahdi, quote unquote, the kingdom come. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gives us enough knowledge. Salah and bequeathed in his own man knowledge about the Mahdi and the end of time until kingdom come. He's given us that type of knowledge, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Well, can you feed? There's a benefit. Kayfa haluka ma'Allah. What's your state with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? Is this gathering like sort of I mean, watching an action movie? Is there an action of emotion and excitement? Or is there an action of spiritual elevation and fear? of the self and fear of the people of the age in which we live in. What, what type of gathering is it? The sign that it's a gathering that, mashallah, tabarakallah, that it's something for you, yawm al-qiyamah, is what happens beyond here. When you start to see tangible change in your limbs, tangible change inside of your worldview, your mind, tangible change inside of your soul, the depths of your soul, and I mean for real, Real tangible change, not delusions of grandeur or delusions of change and conceit, then khalas, you're a person who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're it. Allah ta'ala wants khair for, wants good for you. If you lack that, tatadarra in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and pray for faraj. Pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a way out of this situation. And so the Prophet sallallahu wa sallam, he gave us in a hadith of zahira, traditions, that are accessible I mean, for those who delve, which means there's an element of what? Of being bequeathed to the general populace of the Ummah, of those who desire to know. He gave us signs by virtue of which we can begin to recognize the Mahdi. When we spoke in our gathering about the Hadith in Gabriel, the Hadith of Gabriel inside the Sahih Muslim, where the Prophet وسلم, when he was asked by Gabriel, أخبرني عن الساعة, and he tell me about the hour. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, Mal Masulu Anha min Okay? Which translated, and we spoke with the complexity of that statement of the Prophet, وسلم, but translated, it means nothing's going to be mentioned. Okay? That's the upshot of what he's saying. Then Gabriel says, an amarati. So then tell me about the Amara. You know what the word amarat means? We call it the signs of the hour. But the amara are when the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are enacted. From the word amar. It's when Allah ta'ala enacts things that relate to the very collapse, destruction of his universe that he created subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Prophet Islam spoke about two things which yani, yani, guarantee you take any commentary upon it 
The ulama of the Inwood are not telling you about what it means. Guaranteed. So, and tell the Amatu Robeta, when Taral, Hufat, and Rula, and Arata, Alat, and Riaisha, Yatata, and Luna, and Bunyan, is when you see a woman giving birth to a mistress in a riwayah, and a woman gives birth to a master, Rabbaha, that's a riwayah, and then you see the naked, barefoot, destitute shepherd, Yatata, and Luna, and Bunyan. And then we said the meaning of yatata walunu fil bunyan is inward and outward. Yatata walunu fil bunyan, when you see people who their very nature should be humility. These are naked, poor, barefoot shepherds, but they yatata walun. They are arrogant inside of these edifices that they've constructed. And then of the meanings yatata walunu bunyan is the building of those very edifices themselves. Those quote unquote uh, buildings that scrape the sky. Have you ever wondered what does it mean to a skyscraper? I and mean, what's the symbolism behind something that's meant to be you know, scraping the heavens? Yeah, who are you, Jack and the Beanstalk? Are you scraping the heavens right here? And what does that mean? It's the arrogance of the people of the age of Duhayma. Uh, and the people of the age of As-Samma, Wal-Bakma, Wal-Amya, as he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said the final aim, blindness, deafness, and dumbness, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But what is the issue here? The issue relates to signs that relate to man in and of himself, man, i.e. these shifts, seismic shifts that change us from this original state that Allah Ta'ala created all human beings upon, the aboriginal state. All human beings. In another way, all human beings are born. Sons of Adam and daughters of Adam are born upon Fitra. Aboriginal, pure state. We're all born. Then what happened? And at the end of time, there is a radical shift in what we previously called man. And we can question whether man exists in its truest sense upon the face of the earth. That can be questioned. Well, in terms of those who we see and those who we see when we gaze inside of the mirror. And then the second are these shifts that begin to appear inside of the cosmos of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You all, I mean, we're all sort of cool, we're all alhamdulillah, we're listening, ah, it's all good. Araftum, for a few days we should have been I mean, scared as hell about what was taking place and is taking place upon the island here. You see, when rain falls, are, are we singing in the rain? Like Gene Kelly? <laughs> or, or should we be crying in the rain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not manifest something that is there upon the law al mahfur As one of the great Imams of Hadramaut, Habib Ali ibn Shihab, radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda, spoke about this island that we're upon. And every time it happens, you see that type of rain and villages being flooded, you should remember this statement. This is uh, of the teachers of Habib Amr bin Hafiz. Who makes mention of his son is of the teachers of Habib Amr bin Hafid, Sayyid Muhammad bin Alami. And his grandson, Sayyid Abdullah bin Muhammad bin Alami, Ayn al Tarim. He's the spring well of Tarim in the age in which we live in now. Sayyid Abdullah bin Muhammad bin Alami, bin Shihab, radiallahu anhu warda. Here's what he said about the island in which we are upon. He said that England, a land he's never visited, doesn't know what. He said, the island of England, it will either become Muslim or Allah is going to sink it into the sea. That's what he said. And he's the Imam of the Hadarima, of the Habaib, who they say about him, Yani Yakra al Ghaib, Satra, Satra. He reads the unseen line by line. That's his access. That's something that is there. About this island, cave, does it become Muslim or does it sink into the sea? The good news, folks, <laughs> is that Allah, the people of Allah Ta'ala, says, that this land is good, this land is blessed. And moreover, what they tell you, virtually by ijma'ah, that and this is the way they say, in this age, that the king of England will become Muslim. No, they don't say the queen. They say the king of Islam will become Muslim. And if you ask the people of Allah, this is not ratiyasi nation, okay? And although it's knowledge likewise bequeathed from the Rasul, sallallahu they see it. That's what they see. That's what they make mention of. Go and ask them. Huh? If you meet them, be sure to ask them. And tell the fakir mention you should ask them as well. <laughs> and 
give me a phone call when you do and tell me their response, what they say. Uh, this is the island upon, upon which we are on. Alhamdulillah, history as it plays out, it'll be good. Usually as things are in the beginning, they will, they will be in the end. And England is the island of the angels. That's what England means. Okay? It's the island of the malaika. Inshallah ta'ala. But it's also the island of Gog and Magog, by the way. <laughs> the, the, the protectors of the city of London. That's Gog and Magog. Go and see who protects London. Uh, Gog and Magog, usual as usual. So there are going to be signs for the manifestation of the Mahdi. And the signs for the manifestation of the Mahdi, they will relate to him as a reality, but they'll also relate to the cone in which he's in. Things that you can identify in him Things that you can identify in the movements of human beings around him and things that you can identify in the alteration of the cosmos of the world as we know it. And in three different degrees. You can mention many signs. What's the first sign of the end of the time? The Prophet ﷺ. His life is the first sign and his death is the first sign. But if we quote unquote fast forward to the age that we're speaking about, there are multiple signs that we could begin at. And for most of the signs, maybe you alluded to. I mean, what happened in the early 90s with the invasion of Kuwait on behalf of Iraq? Okay? And mentioned by the Prophet, وسلم, as we said. And that the Prophet, وسلم, naming Saddam Hussein by name. And a Sufiani, called him the Sufiani. Who's the Sufiani? Sufiani is one of the most fundamental signs of the Mahdi. When the Sufiani manifests, then the Mahdi will manifest. Okay? Who is the Sufiani? Why is he called the Sufiani? Because his lineage goes all the way back to somebody called Khalid ibn Yazid ibn Abu Sufyan ibn al harb ibn Umayyah ibn Abd shams ibn Qusay. Huh? That's who it goes back to. That's his, his lineage. Huh? We all know Abu Sufyan, don't we? Sira. The nemesis of the Prophet a period of time until Mashallah enters into the fold of Islam. And then he begins to en engage the wonderful will of Nubuwa and prophecy. When he sees the Prophet approaching for Fatah al Mecca, he says, Whom to Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, to the uncle of the Prophet, Lakar Asbaha Mulku ibn Akhika Awim, that the kingship, the dominion of the son, of your brother has become great. He says to whom? To, to Ab, Ab, Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. Abbas says, Wayhaka, woe to you. This is not kingship. This is prophecy. That's what Abbas says. And so here he goes back to Sufiani, goes back to somebody called Khalid ibn Yazid. Yazid is the brother of Muawiyah, and their father is whom? Sayyidina. Sayyidina Abu Sufyan, Sayyidina Abu Sufyan, Sayyidina Yazid, Sayyidina Muawiyah, all of them, Ashab Rasul, their companions of the Messenger of Allah. But the son of Yazid is somebody called Khalid, and from his lineage, note, it's not from the lineage of Muawiyah, comes somebody at the end of time called whom? Called the Sufyan. Traditions, there are two Sufyanis. Okay? The first Sufyani, some will convert to Saddam Hussein, because the hadith literally mentions it. The hadith literally mentions where his lineage goes back to, where the lineage of his mother goes back to. He's from the tribe of Caleb. Those who are on the northern side of the Euphrates, Tikrit, makes mention of that. Describes them by a lazy eye, something with his eye. Raftum, management. Then, by name, a Sufiani who was Saddam. How many people in history carry the name Saddam? How many people? Like, do you know? Go and knock on your next door neighbor and ask, is your name Saddam? Guaranteed you it's a no. <laughs> How many people know, have you ever heard of called Saddam? Was Sufiani who was Saddam? The Prophet says, Sufiani is Saddam. And Saddam means like the destroyer. That's what the name means. And then the Prophet says, said, well, who was Saddam? Liman aradahu. And he will destroy anybody who opposes him. Heck of it. The Prophet even made mention of the victories that he has too. Then the Prophet Sallallahu even made mention of his destruction, that he'll be killed. And then the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned something ajeeb. Khair wa shah, good and evil in this Sufiyani. It's good and evil. And Allah Ta'ala knows how his end is. 
And Allah Ta'ala knows how his end was. And there are people, <laughs> Allah Ta'ala's people, who said, Istaghrabna inda motihi. Yani, we were amazed at how the man died. Yeah, yeah, look, it's there for all of us to see if you haven't already saw it, how he died. A person whose last words is Muhammad. Yeah, that's how he died. He got there. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad. And then he dies. And it, and it, yeah, you're amazed that somebody who has a history that he had, and that's how he goes out of the well. Yeah, that is strange. And the affair of God is strange. But then the Prophet وسلم, then gave us an indication how long between him and the appearance of the true Sufi Ali. There's two of them. Okay? The first Sufi Ali and the second Sufi Ali. And we are more so interested in the second Sufi Ali. Because he's the sign of the man. Okay? The first Sufi Ali from Iraq. Second Sufi Ali, that's what's called Iraq al Sham in the Hadith. He's from the Iraq of Sham, northern Arabia. The second Sufiani from Sham, in and of itself, from a place called Qad'a. Right there, it's the exact place where he's from, made mention of. Okay? And his rule will manifest out, out of Damascus, in and of itself. Okay? And these fitness, we should be aware of these fitness. And the fitness that now have gripped Syria. Look at the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam, he said that there will be an embargo upon Iraq. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam wa sallam. And then, and such that not a silver coin or a loaf of bread will reach them. He said, but it's an embargo upon them. Then he says, then there will be an embargo upon Sham. What is Sham? Four territories. Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan. That's what you call Sham in our day, yani the Levant. Okay? Then there will be an embargo upon Sham. Such that a, a gold coin or assistance will not reach them for a second. Then the Prophet fell silent. Then the Prophet said, Then the Sufyan in the Mahdi will appear. Look at the Rasul. But he used a word in the Arabic language that the ulama are struggling to mean because when he second, when he fell silent for the period of time, they say the period of time that he fell silent for is an illusion to the period of time between the embargo of Sham that we witness now, and the embargo of Palestine, the embargo of Syria, the embargo that we witness in our day and age, and its manifestation. And the fitna of Sham is an important sign of the Mahdi. The hadith of the great Imam of Medina to Manawara, Sayyid Sa'id ibn Musayyid, radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda, the Imam who held the Imamate of the Medina, of the Mosque of the Prophet Sa'id for 40 years, Sayyid Sa'id ibn Musayyid, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, then he speaks about a fitna that will grip Syria. And it begins with It begins with to Sibian. It begins with the play of children. And it ends in two riwayahs. One, with the manifestation of the Mahdi. In other riwayah, it manifests with the, with the declaration from the heavens, the voice of Gabriel, that the Mahdi is manifested. That's from the signs. The voice of Gabriel that comes out of the sky. Okay? Hear the tradition. You see the fits that we're in, in Syria, that you witness in Syria? How did it begin? That's exactly how it began. We look a bit of Syria, trace it back, and there are places. What it began with? Kids who were writing graffiti upon the wall. Kids who were playing. That's how the whole thing began. And he speak to the ulama of Syria. Ask them, uh -uh. it's a fits that we're in the midst of. And that fits will not cease, save that the Mahdi will manifest. Akana. That the Hadith of Sayyidina Sa'id al Musayyib alludes to. Okay? And so the Sufiani will call will manifest out of the Iraq in and of its out of Sham, Damascus in and of itself. The Sufian. And he's a major sign when he walks upon the face of the earth. Yeah, the other major signs yani, yani, of the manifestation of the Mahdi is what happened in war in Afghanistan. Major sign. And in the Prophet وسلم, multiple traditions about what happened in Afghanistan. That the Prophet وسلم, he mentioned that those people who carry the black flags, what's called Rayat al Sud. Here's what he said, Rayat al Sud. And you can interpret it as you want. Rayat al Sud, the bearers of the black flag. And then the Prophet Sallallahu not only what? Called them the bearers of the black flag, because in history, people have bore the black flag and claimed that was the flag of the Mahdi. 
The bearers, what's called Raya to Sud, they are major signs of the Mahdi. And they come from where Khurasan. Khurasan, for all intended purposes, is one of two places. It's, yeah, it's Greater Persia, Mawara and Naha. So you can speak on Iran, you can speak on Afghanistan. How then can we determine it's only those two territories in particular? Because the Prophet said in the army of Khurasan are people who come out of a place called Taliqan. A place called Taliqan. And then he said about the people of Taliqan, يَعْرِفُونَ اللَّهَ حَقَّ They have true gnosis of God. These are awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? There's only two Taliqans. One in Iran, one in Afghanistan. There's the two Taliqans. Okay? And there's going to be loops there. Yeah, it's the Mahdi, it's a Mahdi manifest. Out of the war, out of the world of the Shia. Or does the Mahdi manifest out of the world of Sunnah wal Jama'ah? It's a loops. No doubt whatsoever, no doubt whatsoever. He manifests out of the world of Sunnah wal Jama'ah. But there's the, there's the looks, and it, i.e. the obscurity for people who lay to Ma'an, who don't understand the delay. Uh, of the things he describes, the clothes that they wear. And the Prophet Islam, he mentioned that they're going to wear black turbans, and they will wear white clothes. He made mention, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He made mention that what? That they harbor a person who the people of Europe, of the West, believe has done them harm. And then they say, the Prophet Sallallahu said, he said, deliver this man towards his donor's harm. And they say, we will not deliver the man who you believe has done you harm. And so they wage war. The Prophet Sallallahu called them the yellow flags of Rome will come. And then he said, they will be led by a person called an A'raj. He called them the A'raj. What's A'raj? The one who's lame. So what you do is, those who invaded Af Afghanistan, see who had them, who headed them. See who he was. Okay? Shall I help you out? No. But see who he was. <laughs> Give you a clue. Check who was the sort of the former, not the one now, chief of the joint, chief of staffs of the Pentagon. See who he was. Check out who his name is and check out his sifa. And find out if he's the one who led the army against Afghanistan when they invaded Afghanistan. And then the Prophet وسلم, look, and this is important. He says, they will be, yani, they will be defeated but not vanquished. And he said, and they will not return until they carry in the black flags and deliver it into the hands of the Mahdi. Hadith of the Okay? Yeah, what's important? Yeah, important really, you know, when events occur inside of the world, yeah, be careful about what you say. Because your source is like CNN, yeah, BBC, ITV, YouTube, The Beano. <laughs> That's your source about the yani, events that are yani, seismic shifts in their like, human history. And that's where you get your source from. Ah, be careful. I don't say, well, be careful. Yani, whatever it is, whatever it is. And as we said, history is a great interpreter of events. Okay? But that's a sign that which is a kid inside of that land. Okay? Signs, likewise, are going to be the emergence of those black flags themselves that will begin to sort of wage war upon all of the eastern territories that are beyond the peninsula. War. Wars that will rage for over six years. And inside of those wars, you will see names. And all of the names, with the exception of one, are what they call al qa They're just titles. So you have the Abqa. You have Al-Harith, Hurraf. You have the Mansur. You have those, the, the titles. The Mansur is the one who gives victory. The Harith is the cultivator. Names, but the, the titles, I mean, what is the real name? Okay, you love the Hashimi, it's called the Hashimi. You have Nafs al Zakiya, the pure soul. The words the Prophet Sallallahu have used. The only one person that he gave us a name to is someone called Shu'ayb ibn Salih al Tamimi. He gave us his exact name. His name is Shu'ayb ibn Salih al Tamimi. Okay, Ruayas about how he looks, and it requires that he's somebody, he's youth, Shah. He's from the tribe of Tamim. Who's the tribe of Tamim? Tamim runs all the way from Iraq all the way into Hadramaut. Yani, from Iraq right through the Najd of Arabia, the backbone of Arabia. All of those are the tribes of Tamim. So you got people from Iraq who are Tamimis, people from what is now called Saudi Arabia who are Tamimis, and likewise you have people who are from the Yemen who are Tamimis. Because that's where Banu Tamim were. Okay? And he's a Tamimi Shu'ib bin Saleh. And he's of those who leads the great armies. But in that, there are several leaders that are coming out to the east, waging war upon territories that are to the east of the peninsula. 
Okay? And they are finally going to end up in Ilya, in Jerusalem. And it's in Jerusalem, that way they deliver the flag to the Mahdi. But when they manifest, khalas. But of that which they say, although the hadith of the Prophet says, when you hear of the iqbal, of the approach of the black flags, and of the signs that they, they're the people of the black flags, they have the burda of the Prophet And investigate inside of the internet, those or the person who claims he has the burda. Investigate it. Not just investigate it, look for the actual image where you see him rise and place the burda of the Prophet around them. Look for it. And the Prophet said he will have the burda of the Messenger of Allah It's of the sign that this is the Rayat al-Sul. But they will deliver those to the Mahdi, the flags, the, the, the cigar, the smaller black flags, to the Mahdi inside of Ilya, inside of what? Inside of Jerusalem. Okay? But the issue is that they mentioned the difficulty of the age with the Prophet said, if you hear that they're approaching, go unto them, even if you have to crawl upon ice. Meaning, what's the Prophet Sallallahu yeah, The intention to be from amongst them. And yeah, someone who's crawling on ice is not going to get very far if he's crawling upon ice. What do our teachers say about that? They say that you do not enter into the army of the people of the black flags until you see the actual flags in the hand of the Mahdi. Before that, just let it be. Just let the whole thing be. Just be dressed with hair souls on it. Just let it go. Just let it flow. Okay? But these are great people who manifest. Shu'ib bin Saleh. The Mansur, the Hashimi, who is the Hashim and the Riwayat, the Hashimi is the brother of the Mahdi. And half brother, same father. And the Riwayat, the Hashimi is the cousin of the Mahdi. Okay? Paternal cousin of the Mahdi. And there's a point where he actually believes he is the Mahdi. Because too much is happening upon his hands. He's a Hashimi from the same lineage. And he believes he's actually the Mahdi, the Hashimi is called. That's all we know about him. He's just called the Hashimi. Everyone knows what that means? The Hashimi means he's from the Hashimite line. His lineage goes all the way back to Hashim. The Prophet وسلم, is Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, the son of Abdul Muttalib, the son of whom? Hashim. So his line goes all the way back to Hashim, the great grandfather of the Prophet. وسلم. Through the Sibt, through Sayyidina Hassan, through the Sibt, Radiallahu anhuma, Sayyidina Hussein, through the sin, the line goes. And so, for him, there's a loops. In himself, he actually believes, because of the miraculous realities that manifest upon his hands, that he's the Mahdi. That's how difficult it is. One of the greatest Imams of Mauritania, his name is Sidi Abdullah Wil Haj Ibrahim. Some consider him the greatest scholar ever out of the Shanqid. His name is Sidi Abdullah Wil Haj Ibrahim. He has a track that he wrote upon the Mahdi. And he said, the ultimate proof. That the Mahdi is the Mahdi, that he doesn't believe he's the Mahdi. That's the ultimate proof. That's Sidi Abdullah's book, Radiallahu anhu wa rda. So in the Hashimi himself, his belief that he's the Mahdi is the proof that he's not the Mahdi. And he's not the Mahdi. But he's MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Huh? That's victory after victory. Severe things also take place. From amongst them what? The killing of somebody called Nafsa Zakiya. He's called the pure soul. So when the somebody who manifests, who's known as the pure soul, is killed, major sign of the Mahdi is going to manifest. It's called Nafsa Zakiya. Note in history, we have a Nafsa Zakiya, don't we? From Ahlul Bayt. Muhammad, Ibn Abdullah, Ibn Hassan, Ibn Hassan, the Sib, the grandson of the Prophet His name is Muhammad Nafsa Zakiya, who was likewise killed. He was killed by the uncle of Mansur, the Abbasid Caliph. Dress rehearsal. But he's not the Nafsa Zakiyah that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam intended as a sign of the Mahdi. Although he's, he is Nafsa Zakiyah, he's a pure soul. But not this pure soul who's intended as a sign of the Mahdi. So when there's somebody who people yajma are going to concur that he's a pure soul and he's killed in tyranny, khalas, sign of the Mahdi. Then you approach Ramadan, which is going to be an important month. Prior to Ramadan, the Prophet called Motul Khalifa. There'll be the death of a political leader that will shape the very foundations of Islam. That is going to yani, bring about an eruption of war for the very seat of power and control. And who is that Khalifa? 
Allah alam. And some of them speculated the Khalifa of Jordan. Some of them speculated that. Okay? The Hajimite from Jordan. Uh, some speculated. And it did not necessarily come to pass. Some of them speculated the what the Hashimis of Morocco. So it's important to remember they're the two Hashimi kingdoms of the Muslim world. And in Morocco and Jordan, they're led by Banu Hashim, by Ayn al-Bayt. Uh, some of them speculate there. Whereas all this place the moat of the Khalifa, the death of what of what of the of the, of the of the king of Saudi Arabia. Okay? That when that happens, Saudi Arabia will descend into chaos. Okay? With several sorts of power nexuses that will vie for power in and of itself. That's before Ramadan. Okay? In the month of Sha'ban, before Ramadan. In Ramadan in and of itself, you start seeing Taghirat al Khan. You start seeing the actual universe of Allah Ta'ala now shifting, moving. So from the signs the Prophet Sassim tells us about, is on the first night of Ramadan, there will be a lunar eclipse. Amazing, huh? Yeah, there will be a lunar eclipse. You can barely see the actual moon on the first night of Ramadan. But there will be a lunar eclipse, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then in the midst of Ramadan, the 15th of Ramadan, there will be a solar eclipse. In another riwayah, that there's one, and that's never, he said, that's never occurred since the creation of the heavens and the earth. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then in another riwayah, you'll see two lunar eclipses inside the month of Ramadan, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The things that he made mention of. Ramadan, the cone is changing. Then, khalas, you will hear what's called a hedma. There will be an explosion that the Prophet Sallallahu said will be heard by everybody on the face of the earth. That's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. In the tradition, here's the tradition, and we just quote it, and it means whatever it means. In the tradition, what did it say? It says, when it's asked what has taken place, the words are America. That's the words the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. America. And so the ulama speculate in that regard. What does it mean, America? What is an opinion that they hold? And no doubt the Americans themselves hold in that regard. Okay, that's why you'll see it, you know, like, you know, like their films. Films, you know, often they're like dreams. <coughs> Remember, dreams are the lowest manifestation. They're projections of your nufus, of your nafs. And often the projection of your nafs are the fears of the nafs. So you project them into the dream world, into the cinema scope of your dreams. Man, also Western man, projects them onto the cinema scope of what a film. So inside of the films, quote unquote, of holy wood, what you will see is what? You will see the fears of a people. And often, 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 you see the destruction of the continent itself. How, what they would call an act of God or natural disaster. And so there's some of them who hold that what? That what? It's going to be hit by a comet. That is not necessarily going to destroy America, but it's going to destroy great amounts of America. From one perspective, it will split America into three subcontinents. The continent of North America will be split into three after being hit by a comet. From amongst them, there will be parts that will be drowned inside of the sea. Give us an example of what will be drowned inside of the sea. New York. In the hadith of the Prophet, New York will be drowned inside of the sea. That's why if you saw like, um, what was the name? Daniel Kubrick, was it? The director who died in a sort of remake of Pinocchio. Where the things that with Pinocchio, that what where does Pinocchio when he submerges into the sea? And then he finds at the bottom of the sea the Statue of Liberty. What's that telling you? What fear is that? You know, when in the last year when New York, New York State is shut down because of things that are flooding New York. It's been flooded, skies opened up. What's your reaction to that? When you're now in knowledge of the Prophet mentioning by name that New York, New York, New York will be submerged inside the ocean. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is Ramadan. Great seismic events inside of Ramadan. Things that change the very fabric of what of the world as we know. You come out of Ramadan, then it's chaos. Because when you're out of Ramadan, it's the Hajj season. Hajj season begins, A'i, the Niyah of Shawah. But you can now make the intention to go to Bayt Allah al-Haram. But who's <coughs> men? Who is the Khadim, the servant of al-Haramain? al sharifain of the two noble sanctuaries. Matthew is nobody. And so the Prophet Sallallahu spoke about is killing and tribulation that will happen inside of Shawwal 
and then it happened inside of Dhul Ka'dah, and then it happens inside of Dhul Hijjah, Hajj in and of itself. To the point he says, killings, murder will occur at Muna. At Muna. The Hujjaj at Muna will be slaughtered. The Prophet Sallallahu made mention. And it's there that you will see the first manifestation of the Mahdi himself. That's his first emergence. And he emerges, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda, right there in Mecca to al-Mukarrama at the Haram. That's where he emerges. But you've got to know him. And very few people know him. How you could explain in tradition, the only people who stretch their hands to him are seven people. How do you, how do you explain that? There's only seven people who are there who give bay'ah to the Mahdi. In all of that, with the one point, two point, whatever million Muslims that are there in the Haram, there are only seven. In another riwayah, 313, the number of the, of the messengers themselves, the number of Ahl al-Badr, the number of what? Of Saul, the army of Saul, the great number, 313. The ulama gather between them, that is an elite, seven people, and each of those seven, they have 313 elite people behind them, who have allegiance with them. And how do you explain that? What is that you're gazing at in terms of the Mahdi? And what does he look like, the Mahdi? And the Prophet described him, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. The Mahdi, in terms of, of form, he's a Jew. That's what the word says, in form. And he has the body of an Israeli. Israeli, that's what the hadith says, in form. And he's not, and he's, not a, he's, he's, he's pure Aruba, pure Arabian. But he doesn't have the form of an Arab. Okay? That's, that's the way to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he has the complexion of the Arabs. Two hadith about the complexion of the Mahdi. One, one hadith, huwa Asmar. The second hadith, huwa Adam. Asmar or Adam. Okay? You look at Imam al-Burzinji, rahimahullah ta'ala, of the great writers upon the issues of the end of time. Al-Burzinji said, Asman wa Adam, loan al-Arab. He has the complexion of the Arabs. He said, what does it mean? It means the color of air, the soil of air. He's dark skin, that's the color of the Mahdi. That's in al-Burzinji. All the hadith, Asman wa Adam. Only two colors, the color of the Arabs, the ancient Arabs. As the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa is described as, Laysa bil Adam, wala bi abiyad al-Amhaq. He's not Adam, but he's not abiyad al-Amhaq. He's between them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But Adam is the color of his companions. That's what his companions look like in the traditions. Look at the traditions of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab. What was his complexion? The tradition of Sayyidina Uthman, what was his complexion? Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, what's his complexion? Sayyidina Talha ibn Ubaidullah, what's his complexion? Sayyidina Muhammad ibn Maslama, what's his complexion? Look at the complexion of the companions. You see Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani, Ibn Abdul Ba'a, radiallahu anhu wa ra'a, and he affirmed that, and, and um, preserved that for us. That's his complexion. And he's going to have a khal. He has a what in his face that he'll have a mole on his right cheek. Right there, right cheek. You'll know him by that. Note the Hashimi, who's either his half-brother or his cousin. He has a mole in his right hand. That's, he's going to have a mole, a Hashimi, in his right hand. And what's the mole in the right hand usually signify? Prophets. In the hadith, in the Mustadruq of Imam Hakim, the Prophet said every single prophet has a mole inside of his right hand, a sign in his right hand. He goes to the Khab, sallallahu alayhi Except him, sallallahu alayhi his sign is upon his back, the tip of his left shoulder braid, sallallahu alayhi He's a seal of the prophets, that's where his seal is. But the other prophets, their mark, they distinguish a mark is upon their right hand. The Hashim will have a mark upon his right hand, but that really is a mark of the prophets. Uh, the Mahdi, his mark is in his face, right there. Uh, on his right cheek, the Prophet <laughs> Likewise, you see here split teeth, beautiful teeth, yani, he mentioned. That his teeth are beaming white, shining white. That he has a split inside of his teeth. That his face is like illumined. <laughs> Likewise, he'll also make mention of his what? <laughs> of his what? Of his character. Of the things that you know about the Mahdi. That his character is never weak. That the nature of the Mahdi, that is somebody who is upon the prophetic way, the way of the Prophet وسلم, inside of, in terms of his character. In terms of his lineage, the Prophet told us in Hadith in Ibn Majah, in Hadith in Abu Dawood and others, وسلم, that the Mahdi is from us, he's from the family of the Prophet وسلم, in lineage. The Prophet وسلم, in riwayahs alludes to him being from the line of Hassan, and in riwayahs alludes to him being from the line of Hussein, which is really important. Why? If we didn't know already that love of the family of the Prophet ﷺ, min iman, min uqal iman, it's from the very essence of faith, love of the family of the Prophet ﷺ. <laughs> yeah, 
and, and Ahlul Sunnah, for want of a better phrase, they, they've left that quote unquote for the Shia. You know, you know Sunnis, and if you ask, yeah, I'm talking about like ordinary Muslims, walk through the cities in the west or the cities inside of the east, and you ask them Ahlul Bayt, do you think the love of Ahlul Bayt is something for the Shia? And that's the reality of Sunni Islam. Sunni Islam is defined by love of Ahlul Bayt. And those who do not love Ahlul Bayt, or those even, they don't even recognize the existence of Ahlul Bayt. There are people from this Ummah who believe there's no such thing as Ahlul Bayt. Then that's problematic end of time. Because of the greatest signs of the Mahdi is that he's from the family of the Rasul. Some of them have it that in his father's line, he's Hassani. His lineage goes back to Sayyidina Hassan. And in his mother's line, he's what? He's Hussein. That he goes back to the lineage of Hussein. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa rada. He's an, he's an Imam, like in the Hadith in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet Sallallahu says that from my nation are people who are mulhamun, people who are inspired by God. And from those who are mulhamun, who are inspired by God from my nation, is Umar ibn Khattab. Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, Umar ibn Khattab, it's as if upon his tongue was an angel called Sakina, young Tiq bil Haq, only speaking truth. That's Umar, he's mulham. Six times in the Quran, Allah speaks verbatim in the language of Umar ibn Khattab. That's what a mulham means. And he's speaking with the authority of God. Hekada the Mahdi. The Mahdi radiallahu anhu warda, he said his degree in religion yani, is above the fuqaha. Yani, there are those who discuss is the Mahdi. So we understand in, in the conversations we have, and no doubt it's a conversation of Bradford about who's superior from amongst the Sahaba. There are debates in Abu Ahl Islam historically, is the Mahdi better than Abu Bakr al Siddiq? Is the Mahdi better than Umar ibn Khattab? That, that's a debate and the leal with proof. Although Marjuh, although no doubt it's why it's overruled Sunni creed, but the fact that it occurred is at least give you indication of who the Mahdi is rank. Radiallahu anhu warda. Who are the supreme enemies of the Mahdi in the beginning? Who are they? Huh? They say the fuqaha, the people of law and religion, they are the ones who go against the Mahdi. Because he renders like, their knowledge bankrupt to a point. Everything you know about being a Hanafi, or about being a Shafi'i, or about being a Maliki, or about being a Hanbali, or about being a Ash'ari, or being a Matudi, khalas. He negates it, the Mahdi. And he comes with something different. Now can you imagine that everything you've ever knew about Islam, quote unquote from a perspective, is now being challenged by this individual? How then are you going to react to that? Of the ulama of Andalus said that if the Mahdi was not wielding the sword of power, لَأَفْتَوْ بِقَتْلِهِ The fatwa would be to kill him. From within Islam, to kill the Mahdi. In a riwayah that he does to the Madhabs, what the Prophet Sassam did to the previous laws of the Prophet. He just abrogates it all. On what basis? Ilham. Allah Ta'ala, yani, inspiring inside of the Mahdi. Which goes into really profound reality about the issue of his Nafid al-Basira, that he's somebody of deep penetrating insight. Not just into the hearts of human beings, but more importantly, into that which is what inspired in him from God. Okay? He's a man of the highest spiritual realm. <laughs> SubhanAllah. And one of our teachers, sure. Yani, yani, one of our teachers, what did he say? He said, Tayyip, he said it. One of our teachers, he said, here's what he said. Al-Mahdi Sufi. <laughs> the Mahdi is a Sufi. And so you have a problem with the Sufi. SubhanAllah. Al-Mahdi Sufi. That is a man at the highest spiritual order, the Mahdi. Okay? Yani, he ain't interested in, quote unquote, in the world of fiqh. That's something easy for the Mahdi. His world is a higher order. Those who gather around the Mahdi, who are they in the hadith? They're the spiritual masters. Prophet called them the Asayib. He called them the Abdal. He, he called them the Nushaba. That's the way to use. Who are the Asayib? The spiritual masters of Iraq. Who are the Abdal? The Supreme Fort of where? Of Damascus. For amongst whom was Dr. Saeed Ramadan al Buti? He was from the Abdal. Allah Ta'ala took him and has replaced Imam al Buti Rahimullah Ta'ala with another of the 40. From amongst them is whom the Nujaba, the elite of Egypt, spiritual elite of Egypt, mentioned those three, the Prophet Wasallam, the spiritual elite, they're the ones who surround the Mahdi. And he's the spiritual polar, the Mahdi himself. 
Not only that he what he has basira with that which Allah Ta'ala inspires in him, he can recognize that this is from Allah Ta'ala. He can recognize the onset of inspiration from God. In the same way the Prophet Sallallahu how do you know that you're being revealed to? It begins with ringing. He said Sallallahu Alaihi is a sound that precedes the appearance of the great angel. Hakad with the Mahdi likewise. Likewise with the Mahdi is a man of deep and powerful governance. Yet he knows the nature of man. And that's what they say he has the mizan of haq. That he can take the actual amana that Allah Ta'ala has given him. In terms of who governs Jerusalem. Who governs Khorasan. Who governs Constantinople. Who governs Rome. Who governs America. Territories of the Mahdi. The Mahdi will rule the entire earth. And there will be governors beneath the Mahdi. Uh, from Ahl al-Islam is the, the third person who's ever ruled the earth. Suleiman, Dhul Qarnayn, the third of them is the Mahdi, the fourth of them Jesus, the son of Mary, alayhi salam, uh, who ruled the entire earth, Ejma. But with the Mahdi, governance. And he understands what the manner of governance is, and he understands the nature of a person, and he weighs to see whether they are well suitable for that manner. If they're suitable, he gives. If he doesn't, he withholds. They say he's an imam of the war, of the suwar and, and the anfus. He's an imam, knowledge of the world of physical, tangible reality. And likewise, he's also an imam of the world of spirituality, of the world of spirit, the malakut. He understands the nature of that. He's an imam of the arzah, understands how spiritual provision and physical provision and material provision flows through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's universe. His inspiration, they say, is that Allah ta'ala yani, inspires in the Mahdi Good that is descending to humanity and evil that's descending. And the good, Mujrayat al Umur, he just allows it to flow. And then Allah Ta'ala inspires the bad, yet a darra in Allah. He raises his hands to Allah Ta'ala, a bait, a bait, a bait, to send it back. Dua maqbool inside of the heavens. These are descriptions of the Mahdi. Of the Mahdi, ma'al fuqara. And he comes for the downtrodden, the oppressed, the marginalized. That's what he comes for. The Mahdi. He said, that's his people. He's with the common folk. He's not with the elite and the aristocrats. Hakada from the sifat of the Mahdi himself. And these are the sifat labud for us to understand. But of the most what the most yani, difficult of the attributes of the Mahdi himself, what they call al ghadab fil rahma. That yani al rahma fil ghadab. That he has mercy in the midst of divine wrath. What is that? War. That when he unsheathes, it's unsheathed, the sword. And it will be unsheathed, ulama have it, for over a decade, the sword of the Mahdi. In war after war after war, the Mahdi. His affair begins with a threat. There when he's inside of the Haram of Mecca, and he's surrounded by the seven, some say the 313 who, are, who surround him, and they see him, you're the one who the prophets of the long prophesied. He says, me? No, no, no. I'm not the one who was the prophet and prophesied. Who are you? Where are you from? They ask him. He said, I'm a Rajulim in Ansar. I'm an Ansari, he says. And he is Ansar, Allah. But he said, I'm an Ansari. And so they let him be. And then he flees from Mecca to Medina to Manawara. And then they ask about him in Mecca. Sign that they know who he is. The dominant opinion that he's, he's, he's from Medina to Manawara. Raised in Medina to Manawara. Although they have different opinion where he's born. Imam al Qurtubi in his Tadkara says he's from the Maghrib. He's born in the Maghrib. Imam al Qurtubi says that the first land he will take is Andalus, Spain. Qurtubi mentioned that inside the Tadkara. But the dominant opinion left is from Medina to Manawara. Then, khalas, when they approach him, no, I'm not the man. No, I'm an Ansari. Then he flees to Medina. When they find out, no, no he's, not, he's not from the Ansar. He's, he's Hashemi, Hassani of, of line, the holy line. Khalas. They follow him all the way to Medina. They find him there inside the Medina to Manawara. Of the things you'll see manifest in the midst of that, outside of Bab al Salam, yeah, in a place called Ahjar al Zayt. And in Ahjar al Zayt, it was the place of Sayyidina Malik ibn Sinan, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa You come out of Bab al Salam, one of the doors to the house, to the, to the mosque of the Prophet, وسلم, and you turn towards the right, a stone's throw away, you're in a place that used to be called what? Ahjar al Zayt. Malik ibn Sinan. Everyone know Malik ibn Sinan, the father of Abu Sa'id al Khudri. Shaheed of Uhud. He was killed at Uhud because he's protecting the Prophet Sallallahu Human shield for the Messenger of Allah in the Battle of Uhud. That Malik ibn Sina. There, there will be great chaos at that specific place. The Mahdi, when he's approached by these spiritual realities, no, no, I'm an Ansari, wrong person, flees back to Mecca. And they go to and fro from Mecca three times. Until Yawm al-Ashura. And this is from 
Hijja, Dhul Hijja, Hajj, or the, the Yawm Al Ashura, the day of his grandfather Hussein. That day, Yawm Al Ashura, that they corner him between the what the Rukn and the Maqam. Okay? And the Rukn al Yamani, the Yemeni corner that points south of the Kaaba, and the Maqam. Okay? Of Ibrahim alayhi salam. They get him there. And they said, Khalas, you don't see what's happening all around us? All of this is upon your neck. You are him. And at that point, Khalas, the hand will be stretched. And then they're going to give what? The allegiance to the Mahdi himself. And that's declared. Tayyip, look at the fitna. Again, these dress rehearsals. I mean, there was somebody in 1979 who declared he was the Mahdi, huh? Inside of the Haram. He declared he was inside of the Mahdi. And then what happened? Juhayman, huh? Juhayman. He declared he was the Mahdi. And the people, subhanAllah, I know people and who knew him, knew what went down. And they said, like, he believed that. And in the beginning, he never believed it. But those who were around him, they convinced him he was the Mahdi. And then eventually, there was like one person mentioned that on the day it's all going down, they're all coming with Kalashnikovs. It's the Bayaz today. It's today. Are you with us? He's like, Nah, <laughs> I'm not with you. And then they go to the haram, they take the haram between the rukun and the maqam, khalas, they issue the bay'ah. And they said, if you were there, yani, there's why, taken bay'ah, people have come and taken bay'ah, you took bay'ah with them, with your iman, then the man beside him will give you an AK. Bay'ah AK, bay'ah AK, bay'ah AK. Bay AK. That's how it was going down. I roughed up. And then khalas, no sooner that they did that, khalas, obviously the forces of Saudi Arabia begin to storm the mosque of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The mosque of, of the Haram, of Mecca. The mosque, and the way they built it, is like a fortress. Anyone's been there, it's like a fortress. And so what do they simply do? They just jam the whole Haram closed. So what do they then do? And they're asking the, 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 the scholars, quote unquote, of Saudi Arabia, they're asking them for a fact whether this man is a Dajjal, that he's not the one, he's not the Mahdi. You know what they said they were saying? Hold on a minute. You want to see what happens? Let the thing pray out a bit more, then we'll give you the fatwa. Yani, the Saudi army can't take the haram. So what then do they do? Juhayman, they go to the basement of the haram. That's, they all retreat to the basement of the haram. And all those who claim it were around this Mahdi. Okay? What does Saudi Arabia do? They ask for French paratroopers who come out of Sham, come out of the Levant, to come and assist them. That's a problem. Because of the greatest signs of the Mahdi is the army of Sufiyari that's dispatched from the Sham. Head south. In order to take the Mahdi at the Haram. And so they're waiting. What's going to happen to the Mahdi? Because the army's going to be swallowed. Fi Bayda Medina. Not only why Fi Bayda Mecca. In the outskirts of, in the outskirts of Mecca, it's going to be swallowed into the air. So they're waiting. Is it going to be swallowed? Is it going to be swallowed? And it's not swallowed. Ah. And so they get to the Haram. They can't get them at the Haram. You know what they do? They just send water into the haram and they flood the haram. Then they send bolts of electricity into the haram and the electric shot them out of the basement of the haram. And those who died, who died, and those who were captured, who were captured, executed. That was, that was the other thing. Dress rehearsal. Why is it a dress rehearsal? Because the Prophet has said in the hadith of Nu'aym ibn Hamad, he said, there's going to be an a'id, a rajul, a man who will seek asylum in Mecca. In the Haram, claiming he's the Mahdi, for yuqtal, then he's killed. Then بعد برها من الزمان, then after a برها من الزمان, there will be a man, a Aed, who will seek refuge in the Haram, and that's the Mahdi. Okay, and so the ulama say that was a dress rehearsal. And all we've got to understand is the word burha. How long is that? Because in that way, he's telling you exactly how long it will be between that incident that the ulama say, the incident we're speaking about, as the first a'id and the manifestation of the Mahdi himself. Okay? But when he manifests, he's in Mecca, and the army is dispatched by the Sufiani towards, towards uh, uh, Mecca to al-Mukarramah, from Sham. It comes out of Damascus. And when it reaches, like the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, and Muslim and others, when it reaches the outskirts of Medina, outskirts of Mecca, you understand that between Mecca and Medina, then Allah Ta'ala opens up the entire earth. And you'll do this on several occasions in this period. I, we're going to begin to be hearing of people who the earth is going to swallow. That the earth just opens up and people disappear into the earth. Okay? And that's what happens in this entire army. 
The Prophet said, Awwaluhum wa akhiruhum. The first and the last of them in the hadith of Bukhari. The hadith of Aisha, Aisha says, Ya Rasulullah, walakin fihim aswaq. But amongst them are the aswaq. I mean, that is Aisha, this, mashallah. Who the aswaq? The aswaq are like, you know, you, you know, souk, you know, souk. The souk are people who like, who've taken to the world, who hang about in marketplaces. They consider like people who are more so, yani, yani, the poor. Okay? Actually, on the poor, the class of the poor. And what's the problem with the issue of that? And study modern warfare. Study those infantry, those battalions who go out. Study the phenomena. Those who fight on behalf of tyranny, they don't want to fight. It's their only way out in life. It is a job for them. And they don't really believe they'll go to war and have to be killed. But they're sending these poor sons to the killing field. That's what they're doing. You know, the nature of, of real war, prophetic war, our Prophet ﷺ stood upon the battlefield. That's war. That's Rija. I know that that's Rija. Age of the Mahdi, don't be start speaking about war and yes, war and these tyrants should be in. And there's you with a cup of Horlicks, chocolate biscuits, and a remote control inside of your hand. And kind of, that's how we are, isn't it? We can speak about everything except ourselves. Heck, that's the Ghufa'iyah. That's people who lack substance, the age in which we live in. And so the Mahdi here, that entire army, is going to be what? Everyone, beginning and the end. Although there's a riwayah that there are going to be two types. Some say three. Some the earth will swallow and some musikh. Musikh means when they found, they've been transmuted. Yeah, yeah, transmuted. The riwayah that their faces are turned inverted, which one of the signs of the people of hell. Like in Hadith al-Bukhari, saying Abdullah ibn Umar, inverted. Huh? In one riwayah, only one person survives. In another riwayah, two. In another riwayah, two plus a shepherd. One of them, he's the Nadir. He's the warner. He heads north to warn the Sufiani about what has just taken place. The other is the Bashir. He heads south to the Mahdi to tell the Mahdi about what's taken place. And the other is the shepherd who's just like, amazing. One of these witnesses it. He said, the he turns away for a moment when he sees the army. Oh, whoever's in Mecca is in problems when he sees the army approaching. Then he turns away, then he turns back, they've all disappeared. And then he realizes that the entire earth has swallowed them. It's one of the greatest signs of the Mahdi, a supreme sign of the Mahdi. And from that point on, the Mahdi then begins to unsheathe. How does he unsheathe? Look at the way to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We'll bring it to a conclusion, inshallah ta'ala. Sitaghzoon al Jazirat al Arab. You will declare war against the Arabs. And then Allah Ta'ala will grant you victory. Then you declare war against the Persians. And Allah will grant you victory. Then you declare war against Constantinople. And Allah will grant you victory. Then you declare war against Rome. And Allah Ta'ala will grant you victory. Then you will declare war against the Antichrist. And Allah Ta'ala will grant you victory. And so the Rawi then says, and therefore the Antichrist will not manifest until Rome is first conquered. You see that? With the exception of Rome, we've seen a dress rehearsal for it. So you've seen a dress rehearsal for the Arabian Peninsula. You've seen a dress rehearsal for Persia. You've seen a dress rehearsal for Constantinople, Istanbul, Muhammad al Fatih, 1492. You've seen all those dress rehearsals. It's going to appear once again with the Mahdi. So first and foremost, the Mahdi in Mecca, of the things that he do first and foremost, he brings from beneath the Kaaba, the treasures of the Kaaba. Buried in the Kaaba. Uh, Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, which is Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib. And then they went inside of the Kaaba in and of itself, locked the door, the two great Imams of the Sahaba. And Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab says, what do you say? Umar <laughs> says, what do you say? If I watch, should I leave the treasure of the Kaaba in the air? Or should I bring it out and distribute it amongst people? See, Ali ibn Abi Talib says, that's not your job. That's the sheriff at the end of time, the young, young man at the end of time. That's his job, the Mahdi. He's the one who brings the treasure of the Kaaba out. And then he unsheathes upon Arabia. And he brings the entire Arabia under his leadership. And then the Mahdi shifts, engages, what? In Iliyah, when he reaches Iliyah, which is Jerusalem, the Mahdi is going to be met by the forces of what? Of the, of the black flags, the army of Khorasan. And then they move towards Damascus, and then the, the, the Sufiani is vanquished. And then the Mahdi will establish Damascus as his capital. So Damascus becomes like the first capital of the Mahdi, Damascus inside of Syria. And then thereafter, the Mahdi begins to wage war. From that, he's going to move east once again. 
What is that? The Iran. Okay? Declares war against Iran, Persia. It's going to bring that to its knees. The second place, the Mahdi is going to declare war. It's all war. To the point that they say, is this the son of the one who was sent as a ministry to the world? They cannot believe it. It's bloodshed, the Mahdi. So he unsheathes and he doesn't be sheathed. After Iran, where does he head towards? He heads towards um, Israel as a reality. And that way you get into the issues of what happens with Israel, that he brings Israel under his reality, the Mahdi. That's the, like the third of the major territories that he conquers. Then the Mahdi is going to march forth towards what? Constantinople. Okay? Before Constantinople, Antarctica. And of the things that he takes out of the earth in, in Antarctica is what? It's the Ark of the Covenant of the Jews. He brings forth the Ark of the Covenant, the Mahdi. Then the Mahdi with his army, Khalas, they're going to move towards what? Constantinople, which is now modern day Istanbul. Which is a sign about what's about to happen to Turkey. How it's going to drift into a type of heedlessness that it can be called Constantinople once again. And then the Mahdi wages war against Constantinople. How does he wage war, radiallahu anhu wa With dhikr, takbirat, with tasbihat. Allahu Akbar and subhanallah. Riwayah four, takbirat. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. He says it four times, radiallahu anhu wa rda, upon the walls of Constantinople. And he, radiallahu anhu, what does he have? He has the flag of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The standard of the Rasul, he has it. It's the standard has not been raised since the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Mahdi has it. And he puts the standard upon the, the, the shore of Istanbul, the bank of Istanbul. When he places it there and then he, he wants to make wudu, the, the Mahdi, he sees the water begin to move. And then he moves with his what? His standard with the water, the standard of the Rasul towards the water, it moves. Until the in, entire what? See? Parts for the Mahdi, like a part for Moses. And then the army of the Mahdi, they move across towards the wall of Istanbul. Understand that? Yeah, the Asian side, the European side, what they call it now. Uh, the city that was what is on two continents, Istanbul. And now they're upon the European side, which is old Constantinople. And part of the walls still remain. An illusion, those walls will be rebuilt to guard it. And then the takbirat begin. And when the takbirat begin, then the walls fall down, fall. In the riwayah, half of the sea, half of the, the city, which is on water, is going to fall into water. And the other half will remain. And then he takes Constantinople, the Mahdi. And then he's going to remain inside of Constantinople for one year, one entire year. Okay? After Constantinople, where then does he head towards? Setakzuna Rum. Now you're going to declare war against Europe. Prior to that, he's in a Hudna. For nine years. He's in, for nine years, he's in a contract with what? With Europe. Nine, nine years. Until eventually, when they defeat a common enemy, and some of them in the great battle where they defeat a common enemy. Some consider that what they call, in biblical terms, Armageddon. It's when the force of the Mahdi join forces with Europe in a nine-year treaty, and there are going to be two great wars. Malhamat al-Ula, the first great war, or Malhamat al the second great war. Okay? Two great wars. And then thereafter, the forces of the Mahdi are going to face off with the forces of Europe. And that's what you call Malhamat al-Kubra, the supreme war. Okay? Yani when the, the Prophet ﷺ said, we room. Europe on that day is beneath 80 nations, 80 standards. Europe, the EEC, which if you looked at it 20 years ago, nobody was speaking about the United Europe. And we're now in the era of the United Europe. And it's going to reach 80 flags. That's all it reached. Kalam of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But then after the fall of Constantinople, then he marches towards what? Europe. And in particular, the Vatican. Okay? The independent country of the Vatican. Right there in the midst of Italy, in the midst of Rome. It's an independent state. And he takes the entire Vatican. And shof! SubhanAllah. Look what he takes out of the Vatican. He takes out of the Vatican, in the tradition, the Gospel of Jesus. Original. He takes out of the Vatican, the Psalms of David. Original. He takes out of the Vatican, yani the Torah of Moses. Original. He takes out of the Vatican, the pulpit of Suleiman. Original. He takes out of the Vatican the broken pieces of the Ten Commandments of Moses. Oh, original. Man, they got original stuff all there inside of the vault of the Vatican. And the Mahdi can on air the whole nine. There goes the Mahdi. Uh, then, I mean, this hadith, Ajim, which again relates back to our issue. Then he's going to wage war in a place that the Prophet said called Qatir. Wara Rumiya. Beyond the lands of Rome is a place called Al Qatir. Al-Qatir. What's Al-Qatir? 
It's what remains of America. That's what a qata' is. And a qata' means the peace that remains. Qata' It's been cut off from the continent. And then the Prophet even described it. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa wa he called it the major city of Al-Qatir. That he had, it's a thousand miles. Describe the size of the city, this one city, in what remains of America. One thousand yani miles in length. Five hundred miles in width. One city. In the Riwaya, there are still sixty gateways to it. Not the Riwaya, three thousand gateways to it. Out of each gateway comes one hundred thousand soldiers to face off the map. In it is 100 marketplaces, aswak, and it's a place of trade, supreme place of trade. That's all remain in holding on to the dunya to the very end. That's what you've got. And then the Mahdi <coughs> wages war. How? Tekbirat. Mashallah, he's used to it now. Bira dhikr khalas. That's what you can see with the Mahdi. The Prophet said about the people of the Mahdi, Qutuhum yawma idin dhikrullah. Their food upon that day is the remembrance of God. You understand that? This is the age of Allah's remembrance. And if you do not remember God, then you are not of his people. Like one of our teachers, Habib Allah bin Hafil, Hafil Allah, he made mention of the Mahdi is not in need of people who speak about him. Not in need of those people. He's in need of people who give him victory through their character and through their heart that are attached to Allah Ta'ala and the character that is representative of Rasul Allah Ta'ala Sallallahu Alaihi wa alayhi wa wa sallam. That's who the Mahdi needs. And then he brings Qatir to its knees. Huh? takes the whole of what remains, and remains there for nine years. And then thereafter, Khalas returns back. And he returns back to his new capital, which is now Jerusalem. He establishes Jerusalem as his new capital. Okay, moves beyond Jerusalem. Where to? Russia and China. Mentioned in the Hadith. That's when he declares war. Russia and China. Brings them to their knees. Then he returns back and made in India. Eh? That's the last place of the Mahdi, India. And he takes the whole Indian subcontinent, Khalas. He has the whole world subjugated. And then he returns back to where? To what? To Jerusalem. Save, save. That, that conquering of Constantinople has dire consequences, which we'll deal with, inshallah ta'ala, in the last gathering. What is that? The emergence of the Antichrist. As the Prophet said, the Antichrist will emerge, will manifest, and something that enrages him. What is that? The fall of Constantinople. So the fall of Constantinople of Istanbul back into the hands of the Mahdi, that is the greatest sign of the manifestation of the, Mahdi, of the Antichrist in and of himself. Okay, and it's in a very holy city, the city of peace of Jerusalem, where the Mahdi himself will face off against the actual armies of the Antichrist eventually. Yeah? It's going to have a very short rule upon the face of the planet here. And we ask Allah Ta'ala for tawfiq, but we also ask Allah Ta'ala that he gives us, allows us to apprehend and to attain and to ascertain the great sort of realities that, that really are important when we speak about such issues at the end of time. If we're the people of the end of time, and we are the people of the end of time, we ask Allah Ta'ala that He gives us their hearts, and that He gives us their attributes, uh, and He gives us their connection, and ultimately He gives us their end. And what should we say after the name of the Mahdi? And it can't be say alayhi salam. Yeah, you can say alayhi salam. Okay? Although he's not a prophet. He said the Mahdi is not a Nabi. The, the Mahdi is a Wali. After the ulama said. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Is Imam Mahdi already born? Where is he? And how old will he be when he arrives? And his age, the dominant opinion that his age when he manifests, he's 40 years of age. In another way, he's 30 years of age, okay, when he manifests. But the dominant is 40, he's the age of the prophets himself. Has the Dajjal already been born? And is it true that he's chained up on an island waiting to be set free? Yes, both of them are true. And, he, and the Mahdi is, yeah, the, the Dajjal has already been born. The age of the Mahdi, many people have already been born manifest, were ancient, okay? Uh, there's one called Husinin, there's one called Husinin, and he's like the one, uh, the man of age. He said, who's Husinin? The signs of the Mahdi. That he's a person, he's the first one to manifest upon earth after the flood of Moses. And he witnessed the actual war, Ibrahim being cast into the fire. And he witnessed that, okay? He witnessed the salvation of Banu Israel, and he'll manifest at the age of the Mahdi. He's the people of in Tidal. Okay, people who Allah Ta'ala, what they call the Mundarun, Allah has given extended life to. 
of those who also manifest at that time, Khadr alayhi salam. The great Khadr of Surah Al-Kaf. is going to manifest at the end of time. Ayy is already born. And he's awaiting to manifest. Of those who are going to manifest disciples of Jesus, who are not right now in Hilwan, in the mountains of Iraq, in the Hadith in what? In Abu Nu'im, in the Lail and Nabuwa. They're there. Uh, people who've lived since the time of Jesus, sort of Mary. People who've lived since the time of Moses, sort of Ibrahim. People who've lived since the time of Ibrahim ibn Tahrir. He's lived since the time of Sayyidina Nuh, alayhi salam, lived since the time, and they'll manifest at the age of the Mahdi. For amongst them, who's, who's as old as that in and of itself, the Antichrist. Antichrist. Antichrist is already, and he quotes and quotes, Nasallahu sallam ala afi, alive and well. Uh, and he's been witnessed by people, the most famous of them. Then in terms of us for transmission, it's saying it's Tamim al Dari in the Hadith of Sahih Muslim, who witnessed to whom the Antichrist upon the island in the Western lands. Yani, these final wars will it be technological wars with arms, rockets, etc. Then the hadith of the Prophet speaks about what? Horses. The hadith of the Prophet speaks about the Mahdi and his soldiers hanging their swords upon trees. Swords. Speaks about swords. And so that's why some of the ulama, in the opinion there, some of the ulama that they believe that the age of the Mahdi is a long way off. Because they say of the signs of the Mahdi that we have to return back to sort of more traditional warfare. Some of them say that. And then others say, no, when the Prophet speaks about horses and he's speaking about swords, that we can. It can, be, it can be metaphor, okay, means of transport, okay, and, and steel, weapons of war. It can mean that. So that's what some of the ulama hold. Although some of the ulama do say that it, it can presuppose what a, a destruction of the what you know, Neil Postman calls the technopoly. Right? The destruction of that. And some of them mention, you know, like with the comet, which you mentioned, some say it's going to destroy America, that that comet, when it comes close to the earth, that will destroy what? Like electricity and what have you, and that will retain human beings back to that age. That, that's what we mentioned. But, as we said, history, any, any, it's going to be a great interpretation of what is about to occur. What are we to make of groups in Syria that have an abbreviation in ISIS, who is also the mother of Horus? Yani in ancient Egypt mythology, yani, are often, yani it's ancient Egypt mythology, but also, yani just, I'm not going to get into the issue of ancient Egypt mythology, but we should always be careful about ancient Egypt mythology, yeah? Okay? Because Iris and Horus, who are they? And who's Iris and Horus? And Osiris, who are they? People who study Egyptology. And so one thing, we just a point here, that you know what they call the hieroglyphs? The hieroglyphs, hieroglyphs means like, Yani, writing in pictures, and who called the hieroglyphs? And who imposed that term upon the way of ancient Egypt? That was sort of European Egyptologists, well known, in particular the people of France, and the French Egyptologists, they don't want to impose that. So you should ask a very important anthropological question. What did the ancient of e people of Egypt call that script? And they called it, in, in their language, they called it Medunetchen. Medunetchel. What does Medunetchel mean? <laughs> Kalamullah, the word of God. That's what it literally means. And when that becomes your apostle, then maybe you begin to reinterpret those scriptures in a very different way. In a really radically different way. Because you've got to account for the fact that the longest epoch of man upon the face of the earth is Egypt. Like they've ruled for ten thousands of years, a conservative estimate. And then where were their prophets? That's what you've got to ask. So, and in this, Allah Ta'ala Adam, you know, we start getting into all that funny business, isn't it? Masonic. Order. And you get into all of that type of stuff, Yanni. No, we are not going there, Yanni. Peer mean. Okay. What does peer mean? I'm sure somebody here can answer that better than me. And if someone's asking about issue of peers, them, and, he, and he's the Mahdi appear. Well, I don't know. Can you tell us more about the Mahdi sword, the sword of power? Where does he find it? Is it already in existence or is it crafted for him and you? Yeah, interesting question. I mean, the Mahdi is a man of war. And his shi'ar, you know what his shi'ar, his battle cry is? A myth, a myth. Die, die. 
That's the ages die. So that's the battle cry of one of the leaders of the Muslims. Die, die. SubhanAllah. Rahmat al ghadab Mercy in the midst of war, divine love. <laughs> yeah, the question there was, will the Mahdi be of any tariqah? <laughs> or maybe you could ask, is the Mahdi from Bradford? <laughs> no, B8. Whichever. <laughs> that where he's from. Yani, I said, the Mahdi comes and what is his order is above and the jurisprudence. And that's important. That's why our teachers teach us, although our teachers are Shafi'i scholars, they don't have any khalas. They're ready to let it go. They're preparing themselves to let it go. That's really important. And people who hold fast to their madhab, as if that's the objective in religion, they're going to find problems. People who hold fast to their tariqah, right? not necessarily that they're going to find problems in, in, in the truest sense. Yeah. Why? Because the Mahdi has his people around them, who the awliya. And those awliya are people of tariqah. So it, 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 it can be an illusion to what those two turuq remain in. But well, subhanAllah, look, let's give you why those who surround the Mahdi. First bayah are seven people. We said some say it's 330. And some say those seven have 330 each, each people of bayah to them. <coughs> Second issue is that there's going to be nine elite people around the Mahdi. You know in the hadith, those nine elite people, none of them are Arabs. But they all speak Arabic. His nine elite was Arab. None of them are Arabs. That's what's mentioned about the Mahdi. Also, what's made mention, I mean, for our sisters here, of those who give bay'ah to the Mahdi, women. They're there in the bay'ah of the Mahdi. That's mentioned in tradition. And likewise, of the bay'ah in the Mahdi, of those who give bay'ah are people from Europe, in and of itself. In the traditions of the Rasul. All those Bushra, alhamdulillah, they're glad tidings. Don't worry, you're cool with your tariqah, inshallah. Keep hold of it. Any questions, inshallah? Any questions? No. Uh, these references you've made in the lecture, can they be referenced on the internet somewhere? Or? Uh, the, the reference in the Arabic language, so yeah, the books, if you want to look, look at books which deal with the Mahdi in Albert knowledge, you could in, in Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Abu Dawood in particular, Ibn Majah in, in particular, a hadith there. Uh, anything that captures all of it? Uh, in, in English language? Doesn't uh, No. Ideally. I don't know, I'm not really a good reader of English. But what you'll find is, it's probably an anfas al-kitab, that the most beneficial book that relates to the Mahdi in the end of time is a book by um, um, Nu'aym ibn Hamad. And who's Nu'aym ibn Hamad? He's the Shaykh of Imam al-Bukhari. I'm saying that Nu'aym ibn Hamad, he has his, like Bukhari has his collection of hadith, Nu'aym ibn Hamad also has a collection of hadith. If you go to the, if you wake up with Imam Nu'aym ibn Hamad, the Shaykh of Imam Muhammad Ismail al-Bukhari, that's where you have emphasis of kitab, of the greatest works you read that relate to the Mahdi himself. And that's what the latter Imams rely upon, like Subhra Zanji, like the Suyuti, and others who are the law Salaamu Alaikum, Shaykh. Forgive me if you answered this question. Maybe translated after one is, I know there's a 40 hadith of the Mahdi by Imam Abu Nu'aym al-Sahani, Sahib al-Dala'il al so that's translated in English. That's a book you can access. Allah alam, I've not yeah, read it in English, but I've heard that's been translated. Likewise, those in Arabic language, maybe like a smaller book you could probably access is the work of Imam Suyuti, Jami'ah. Imam Suyuti, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, in his Hawil al Fatawa, in his two volume book, Hawil al Fatawa, of different factors. In the second volume of that, Imam Suyuti, Rahimahullah, yeah, he brings a lot of the smaller tracts that he wrote. Okay, a treatise that he wrote from amongst them is a treatise that he wrote upon the Mahdi. So that's accessible. Okay. Naam? More questions, sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question. Um, I know you mentioned the question in the talk, but was there significance of the comet hitting America and splitting it into three? Is there significance to this? And I refuse. I, I, no comment. I refuse to, com to comment here. What is the solution? Do we live in a system that is essentially Dajjalic? Of course. And it's a rhetorical question. Huh? And we live in a, in a system that is yeah, essentially Dajjalic and it prepares for the, for the final manifestation. It is the final manifestation of the Antichrist. Uh, what is the solution? 
for the Muslim individual. Right now, solution, I'll give you two solutions. One easy, not going to be harder. And the others, fair solution, Surah Al-Kahf on Fridays. Okay? Every Friday, recite Surah Al-Kahf, beginning to end. Yeah, and if you don't recite it, you ain't serious about this. Okay? Type, oh, Surah Al-Kahf is a long surah. Type, the Prophet made it easy for them. Ten verses in the beginning. Just the first ten verses. Oh, but I like the end better. Toy, made it easy as well. You can do the ten at the end. You like, do the ten at the end. Oh, but that ten's a bit too much. Toy, Hadith Abu Darda, five verses in the beginning. Oh, but, shh, no, oh, but, khalas. <laughs> Obey the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Second, is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave us a dua inside of Salah. Some of the fuqaha, like of the Shafi'i school, consider it to be wajib to say inside of your prayer. Wajib, from the prayer and of itself. That you seek refuge from amongst them, from the Antichrist, inside of every single prayer that you do. Some forgot to say that why did you have to, but why you don't have a prayer. Okay? A, a, a third thing, this one's a bit more difficult, but it, I think it has to be spoken about at a communal level. We really have to prepare to live somewhere else. We really have to prepare for that. Wherever that somewhere else may be. But if a sweep up prepared to live somewhere else here, we've got to prepare to, to live beyond the cities, inside of more rural locations. Because the Dajjal does not enter yani, rural locations. Okay? And part of the meaning of that, you want a meaning of that to bring into your life, we have to prepare to control the sources that allow us to survive. We've got to control our own water, we've got to control our own food. When it all goes wrong, and we in trouble, and in big trouble. And often, you think when it's all going down, you're still going out with your trolley in Asda or Morrison. <laughs> Asda and Morrison are over, and we have a problem. How are you going to eat? Ah, and we're not people who fast Mondays and Thursdays, white nights, black nights. We're not people who are used to fasting. We're not people who are frugal in the intake of food. We're not trained for difficult times. And difficult times, believe me, are approaching. And the Fakir and the Khalas lived in Damascus, lived in the Yemen, lived in places that now, mashallah, tabarakallah, they're in fear. And it, it, people eating cats and dogs, yeah. Are often that they saw their entire reality flip upside down overnight. That's the age in which we live in. The, the age of haste is where change is swift. It's overnight change. Even the Mahdi himself, in the hadith of Muslim Ahmed ibn Hanbal, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah yuslihuhu fil layla. In one night, the Mahdi becomes upright. upright. One night, it's not progression. It's like on his 40th birthday, what a beautiful birthday that is for the Mahdi. One night he becomes upright. That's the hadith of the Muslim of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Okay? So, yeah, you should prepare for that. Okay, somebody from Keithley, he sent me a receipt. Uh, I don't know, a customer copy. Oh, he bought petrol. I guess it's on the other side. How many years between the two Sufyanis? How many years between the two Sufyanis? Burha. It's a Burha. Burha, a rough dog. <laughs> yeah, just here, and this is like being, and obviously to say this topic, is that expect it at any moment. For real, expect it at any moment. Uh, that's how Allah's people are living. And we're meant to follow Allah's people. Okay? And they know better about what's about to happen. So live in that expectation. Inshallah, grant us all tawfiq and our children protect us all, inshallah.